Hello and welcome to Inequality Talks, a podcast from the volunteers of the Economic Equality Group at Melanfocalit San Viego Aarhus. In each episode of Inequality Interviews, we interview experts in a field or topic related to economic equality. Today we will be talking about supply chain law and how it relates to inequalities, namely how inadequacies in supply chain law can exacerbate and perpetuate existing inequalities, as well as create new ones. This episode is made as part of the Our Food, Our Future initiative. The initiative, which is co-funded by the European Commission, is an international coalition of civil society organizations working towards changing the global food system to be sustainable and socially just. In Our Food, Our Future Denmark, we try to bring issues of food justice to the forefront of public debate. The topic of supply chains is a particularly important one when we talk about food justice. We'll explore this later on in the episode. But first, let me introduce myself and our special guest for today. My name is Elise, and with me today are Florian and Malice from ActionAid France. So, a little bit about our special guests. Florian is the Decent Work and Corporate Accountability Deputy Campaigner at ActionAid France and is also in charge of the Our Food, Our Future project there. She recently graduated with a master's degree in human rights and humanitarian action from Science Po Paris and has had several internship experiences in human rights organization. So welcome, Florian. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your experience working with human rights and how it has led you to where you are today? Hi, everyone. Sure. Well, I completed a six-month internship with the humanitarian organization Mystic Corps in GRC and then an 11-month fellowship with Frontline Defenders, an Irish-based organization that works to promote and protect human rights defenders. So this experience really allowed me to meet with human rights, land and environmental rights defenders, trying to support local communities facing the arrival of multinational agribusiness taking over their land with impact on the environment and human rights. So So the situation really made me aware of the failures of the food supply chain mm -hmm. and in particular of the regulation of multinationals and the due diligence need. Wow, that sounds like a really, really fascinating and rich experience. Um, thank you for sharing. So uh, Melise uh, is a campaigner at ActionAid France um, in matters of corporate accountability and decent work, like Florian. Um, and as a campaigner, she does a bit of everything. So that means political advocacy, uh, public awareness raising, project management, strengthening partnerships with labor unions, all to promote better working conditions and accountability of companies. Uh, so very important work. And prior to joining ActionAid France, she's worked with international solidarity NGOs. So, um, Melise, could you maybe explain a bit about uh, what an international solidarity NGO is and maybe a little bit about your experience in Colombia? Sure, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I spent a few years in Colombia working for the protection of uh, human rights defenders and I also worked on the implementation of the peace process there. And I got to witness firsthand uh, the impacts of corporate activities on local communities and their environment. And to me, multinationals are actors that cannot be ignored when we try to tackle human rights violations yeah. all around the world. And I feel it's absolutely necessary to better understand the role that they play and the power that they hold. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you. And I think that's where we'll, we'll try to um, dive a little bit into this episode about how multinationals act within supply chains and how um, basically their actions are uh, without scrutiny. So um, first for our listeners, let's maybe uh, back up a bit and talk about what a supply chain actually is. Um, so you can look up a definition and it would say the network of a company and its suppliers to produce and distribute a specific product to customers or consumers. So that means everything you buy in a store has a supply chain. Um, and these supply chains can get extremely messy, extremely complicated, because um, practically every product has multiple tiers of producers, vendors, warehouses, transportation companies, distribution centers, retailers. So it can end up being a very, very complicated answer to the question, how is, for example, an iPhone made? 
Um, and if we use an iPhone as an example, you have multiple steps there. You have the extraction of raw materials like metals um, and metal ores. Then you have all of the components that need to be made, uh, which can be over 200 components for one cell phone. And then, of course, you have to have all of those components assembled into an iPhone, and then those iPhones need to be distributed. So there are multiple, multiple steps um, where things can go wrong. For example, if a company like Apple um, doesn't have enough knowledge about what happens when those components are being made in different places, um, or maybe they know, but they don't have necessarily control over, let's say, the working conditions of the factories where this microchip is produced. Um, yeah, so that's a little intro about supply chains. So why is it important then that we understand what supply chains are and why are we discussing them here today in this podcast about inequality? Well, first, European multinational are responsible for many human rights and environmental abuses along their supply chains. So it can be land grabbing, expropriation of local communities who lose all their homes and farmlands. So local communities are sometimes not consulted or receive insufficient compensation, which are forced to accept, often under pressure and intimidation. Then the loss of agricultural land then implies a loss of income and resources for local populations and then encourage precariousness, like in some village in Guatemala, where multinational invest in palm oil plantation. So in addition to deforestation, for instance, plantation have a significant negative impact on the environment with the reduction of biodiversity or water pollution. And then this pollution leads to the death of fish and thus the loss of resources for the population. And it undermines human rights like right to food, health, and safety for the population. Mm. So, for example, in Brazil, several plantations illustrate the social and environmental harms of the global food supply chain, like deforestation or carbon dioxide emissions with impact on pollution and climate change, but also contributing to chronic impoverishments and conflict in rural areas. Mm. So we have seen several cases of safe labor exploitation found on properties linked to orange, cocoa, or coffee production. And for instance, the Cocoa Barometer of 2020 states that about one and a half million children are involved in child labor worldwide. So that's pretty really insane numbers. And of course, multinationals are also responsible for labor rights violation. So trade union like ASTAC in Ecuador denounced the horrible working condition on banana plantation with low wages, seasonal contracts repeated for decades at the expense of permanent contracts or unpaid overtime, lack of health insurance or pensions, and lack of adequate equipment with the use of pesticides. And other trade unions like STAS in Honduras really illustrate all the anti-union repression on the melon plantations of the multinational fives with reprisals against union members like dismissal, death threats, attacks, or even judicial harassment. And moreover on this, it's also necessary to adopt a gender perspective and understand that women suffer the negative impacts of corporate activities differently and disproportionately than men. For example, in many countries, women have no rights of ownership, access or control over lands. So when companies take over land that community use to support themselves, women, while largely responsible for subsistence farming, are the most affected. Like all the benefits of investment and corporate activities like job creation or compensation for land expropriation are primarily directed to men. Mm. And gender-based and sexual violence is widespread among supply chains. So for example, more than 90% of women working in tea harvesting or production have experienced or witnessed gender-based violence. And trade practices that put extreme pressure on product prices and costs have real and direct impacts on deteriorating working condition, but specifically for women and in terms of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And the business practices of multinational can contribute to working environments that are conducive to gender-based violence with precarious contract, for instance, working hours, low immunization, or subordination to predominantly male super supervisors. Mm 
And another thing is also that we should not forget that these practices are not isolated and can also be found in Europe, notably in plantation employing migrant workers paid poverty wage. So in the Manaroda region of Greece, for example, up to 10,000 migrant workers, mostly undocumented men from Bangladesh, work in strawberry production for a daily wage of only 24 euros. So they can be deported at any time and live in makeshift shelters in the middle of the field with no sanitary facilities, no running water, and are not able to protest. Mm -hmm. And if I may add, yeah, as you course. see, so as you see, human rights and environmental abuses occur in all sectors, energy, garments, so textile, uh, agriculture, technology. And what those supply chains have in common in all of those sectors is that they are globalized. So on the one hand of the supply chain, you can find a transnational company with its headquarters in a country like France or Denmark. And on the other hand, you can find workers in communities whose basic human rights are not respected in a different country. And in between, there are dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of subcontractors mm -hmm. and entities that participate in the producing of the initial product. In other terms, companies outsource and subcontract parts of their production to countries with lower environmental and human rights standards. In those countries, they can act with impunity and produce at lesser costs. They dodge the responsibility by hiding behind their long and complex value chains, mm -hmm. which are complex by design. And in such case, cases, untangling and pinpointing responsibility is difficult for victims of corporate abuse. Mm -hmm. When European companies are confronted with human rights or environmental abuses in their value chain, many companies abdicate responsibility to their suppliers. And they argue that they have no influence over suppliers despite having hired them. Right, right. So there was a lot mentioned here. If we could do like a mic drop, I would do a mic drop here, but I need the microphone still. So um, thank you for that explanation. You mentioned a lot of really important topics of how um, inequality is um, a product of the supply chains that we have now, these global supply chains that are, as you say, complex by design. Um, so we have, you know, a host of uh, negative consequences of these supply chains uh, and the, the activities of the multinational companies coming in and degrading local communities, degrading the environmental um, integrity of the communities and thereby robbing the communities of their subsistence, uh, not to mention horrible working conditions um, and then how women and girls are disproportionately affected by these uh, negative consequences of multinational activity and um, and then also immigrant workers in global north countries. These harmful practices happen here too. And these are also European companies who like to shirk responsibility onto their suppliers, as you mentioned, Melise. Um, and in the end, European companies need to take on that responsibility. So you've given me some great concrete examples of the socio-environmental harms that European companies have inflicted on uh, local communities, on migrant workers, on girls and women. Um, are there any other specific examples that you would like to talk about that you have you know, personal experience working with? Because you do have a lot of experience working with this uh, uh, very up close and personal, no? Uh Maybe one uh, impact that we can mention uh, that we've seen with our partners on the field, for example, we accompany um, a trade union in Ecuador for many years. And what they've reported is that the impacts of COVID, for example, have been uh, exacerbating their precariousness and the power disbalance with the companies. Uh, also, they've struggled to be equipped adequately uh, to prevent them from uh, from COVID, mm -hmm. um, and this was also a dimension that was reported by a partner in South Africa, but also, like we mentioned, within Europe for the migrants that are uh, working in the in the agricultural sector in France, for example, or in Spain or in Italy, they are also struggling to get uh, adequate health conditions, mm -hmm. uh, living conditions, in terms of housing, decent housing, um, among other many other impacts. Yeah, 
it's always that crises like the corona crisis always kind of exacerbate existing inequalities. Would you say the same? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, all right, on to my next question, because uh, this is something that I find uh, really interesting, because a lot of people want to do the right thing and buy the right product, and that could mean, you know, boycotting particularly destructive companies like Nike or Coca-Cola, um, maybe buying less frequently, so not buying the latest iPhone uh, every year, for example. Um, buying in-season fruits and vegetables, going to non-packaging stores, buying locally, and so on. Um, so in your opinion, how effective can these individual measures be against a whole system of socially and ecologically abusive global supply chains? I mean, these multinational companies um, have, you know, an exorbitant amounts of power. What, what would you say to that question? Um, so, to me, individual measures are essential for people to adopt more conscious lifestyle, respecting human rights, and that's why boycotts and calls for ethical consumption are highly necessary to establish a power relationship with companies, and we've seen that it can be a successful and a powerful tool, but considering the magnitude of the social and environmental challenges that we face, we absolutely cannot rely on those individual behaviors alone. I think we need to get out of the big speeches that aim at making individual citizens feel guilty and responsible right. um, in order to put the focus back on the multinationals who are the bigger polluter and uh, the bigger human rights abuser. We need public authorities to make the protection of rights and of the environment truly mandatory for companies. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of our work as an NGO is to inform the public of the violations that we document and provide an analysis of the cost but also, and it's very important, to elaborate demands to those who have the actual power to produce change and improve working conditions um, of the workers. So, for example, at Action at Friends, uh, when we try making visible the abuses that occur in a banana plantation in Ecuador, we don't want the supermarkets like Carrefour or Aldi to stop buying their bananas from this plantation and leave the workers jobless. What we want is to show that the actors of the agro-industry have the power to fix purchases, uh, prices, and practices along their supply chains. They have the power and the responsibility to ensure that workers are given decent wages, mm -hmm. that they are provided with protective equipment against pesticides or against COVID, that they are registered to the national health system, that sexist and sexual violence is tackled efficiently. And all of this is possible if they reduce their margin and if they truly apply the principle of due diligence throughout their supply chains. Mm. May I just um, ask a question? Then? Um, because you, you said that boycotting a company can have very positive outcomes um, and has in the past, but you also say that you don't want a grocery store to stop buying bananas from this plantation in Ecuador because it would leave the workers jobless. But wouldn't boycotting a company, in essence, have the same effect? Yes, of course it can. Uh, that's why as an organization, we, for example, it's not something that we advocate for the, bo the boycott because of that reason, uh, specifically. Um, but then you have to see for each case and each situation um, what opportunities of dialogue you have and of correcting the imbalance in power between the workers and, and the company, for example. And there you can identify if you have opportunities of, uh, of putting pressure on the companies so that they can change their practices and, and get better within their supply chains. So when would boycotting actually make sense then? Well, I think as the thing, because like you might be boycotting, but you don't really know what's going to happen afterwards. You know, you might be doing a boycott and actually just a media action. So at some point, the multinational will take like commitment to improve stuff. And then like, but at the end, you will see that there's no real commitment. It doesn't really change the situation of workers. But, you know, you also might have boycotting that really work. But the issue is that I think when mine is talking about opportunities, that you really need to see if 
this boycott can really have like great effect on the workers at the end because if you do boycott and during like days and weeks workers can't pay like can't buy food for the families or like don't have any income and then at the end you don't have any commitment from the multinational you need to maybe consider your strategy like did it worth it so that's why like adding advocacy and campaigning you have kind of like opportunities checking of risk matrix like you know is there like a better investment in boycotting and having workers not work at that moment or is it actually like a wrong idea because it's not the good moment to do it or because you don't have enough civil society media or institutional support so i think like mm. for me boycotting is really like thinking about opportunities is that the right moment mm. are we able to put enough pressure is the company open to dialogue or is it just like you know like social mm. and brainwashing when they commit to something and actually don't do it and because we lose the media coverage after the boycott we mm. don't have like the enough pressure to make sure like that commit but i think that also like organization wise as we work a lot with trade union and workers so we always try to take into account their theory of change what do they want what is their focus right now and then we need to really hear their voice and think about their need if we talk with trade union and they talk to us right now and say okay we can't have a boycott right now because for so many reasons it's not a good moment for us or because internally we know that the multinational won't change the practice then as an organization linked with trade union and workers we might decide is not the right moment mm, so yeah, i think in general boycotting is like really depending on opportunity and then it's like really each organization like mm. objectives and work to decide if this is a good thing to do right now yeah yeah because i remember my partner was telling me about a movie screening that he went to um it was a documentary about a um was it a clothing factory i think in bangladesh and um the woman who directed the movie was actually there at the screening and was answering questions at the end of the movie. And um, someone asked, okay, what what can we do? And then she said, well, because I think the factory was making clothes for H&M. And then she said, don't stop buying clothes from H&M because this is actually our livelihood. And, um, and that is, I think, one of the saddest parts about these messed up global supply chains because what you in essence do as a company like H&M is you um, entrap local communities that become dependent on this um, excessive consumption in western countries and you're basically held uh, like metaphorically hostage in these communities because now their livelihoods depend on it and you know there's some people who say there are bad working conditions in these sweatshops but if there weren't there the people in the communities wouldn't have jobs so i find that this is an extremely difficult question um yeah yes, it is and that's exactly why at least we at Action at France and Florian and I through our jobs, why we choose to advocate really for strong political regulation mm. of multinational and of companies because we understand that both here in France, for example, we cannot just make everyone feel guilty about buying cheap clothes mm -hmm. at H&M or any other uh, retailers' mm -hmm. uh, brands. But we also uh, have that in mind, right? The livelihood of... Uh, of, uh, of all of those workers in the producing countries. Yeah. So that's why the option of um, having the laws establish norms and frameworks mm -hmm. that ensure, that make sure that, that make it mandatory for the companies to respect truly decent wages, to respect, to ensure that they have their rights protected. Mm -hmm. Well, this is why we think it would be a very efficient way uh, right. to have an impact and a long-term yeah. impact. And that actually leads me to the next question, um, which is about a new law that was proposed in the EU Commission in April of last year, which would try to tackle these problems that are hidden in the long, complicated supply chains. So more specifically, this law would require European companies to comply with uh, what's called mandatory due diligence, as uh, both of you have mentioned that term earlier. 
um, across the entire supply chain. So enforcing companies to identify and prevent slash mitigate the negative impacts of their business activities or the activities of their subsidiaries, subcontractors, and suppliers. So as was mentioned earlier, um, right now companies just put their hands up and say, well, I can't control my supplier. So whatever happens up there in the supply, like way up there in the supply chain, that's not my responsibility. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, I believe it was Florian that um, companies have hired these suppliers so they should have responsibility and i guess what's also good about this law is that you know it's a european law so one problem with enforcing standards in uh like for example certain working conditions in factories sometimes companies have just up and left and just gone somewhere else where they don't have as stringent um standards but with a european law maybe that could help tackle this um this flight so um let's talk a little bit more about the details of this proposed legislation and if you could answer what it could potentially mean for society and for the protection of the environment to have this legislation so regarding this proposed legislation uh, back in april 2020 justice commissioner reinders committed to a new legislative initiative which will require European companies to comply with mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. So um, human rights and environmental due diligence is generally understood as a process with which companies can efficiently identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for the negative impact of their activities or those of their subsidiaries, subcontractors, and suppliers. So then, in October 2020, the European Commission launched a public consultation to gather input from citizens and organizations regarding the initiative. Over half a million people actually participated in the consultation, and most respondents demanding a strong EU law requiring all companies to identify, prevent, and address their human rights and environmental risk across their entire value chain. Respondents also agree that companies may be held liable for harmful practices in their home countries and abroad and face strong penalties if they break the rules. So then, in March 2021, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on corporate due diligence and accountability, calling on the European Commission for directive and due diligence, including civil liability and disruptive sanction. And then, in May 2021, the European Parliament adopted another resolution on the liability of companies for environmental damage, as well as a report welcoming the Commission legislative on due diligence, calling for solid provision on environmental protection and stressing the importance of stakeholder consultation. So back in June 2021, it was reporting that the proposal field will be led also by the Internal Market Commissioner Thierry Breton. But ever since, the proposal has yet to be published by the European Commission. And then once published, the European Parliament and the Council will be responsible for examining the proposal. And once the two institutions will have taken a decision, then it will become law. So... Um, a near wide legislation applicable to all business enterprise domiciled or based in the EU or active in the EU market will really help preventing human rights abuses and environmental harms while ensuring a level playing field within the EU, a current legal framework and increased leverage over third parties in the value change. So the effect of socialization, if the outcome is ambitious enough, of course, could really produce positive impacts all along supply chain, like ensuring access to justice and remedy for victims of corporate abuse, involving trade unions in the due diligence process, respecting human rights and environmental rights, such as living wages, freedom of association, health and safety practices, or again, protection against gender-based discrimination. Okay, yeah, so... This is a very ambitious EU supply chain law that would try to tackle some of the huge problems of global supply chains that um, that we have today. Like you mentioned, a few of the most important things is that the companies would have to assess their risks um, all along the supply chain. And um, this would also provide victims of abuses um, in the supply chain that they would be able to uh, go to court. So this law would be one step in the right direction, right? 
So where where are we in the process of this EU legislation? What's the status? So yes, there have been many delays ever since uh, the Commission announced that it would be working on the proposal. Um, we are still waiting on the publication by the European Commission of the proposal of the text that mm. will then be negotiated by the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament. It was supposed to happen in 2021, but it has not been the case. And mm. we have now a remord date for the 15th of February, but it's not sure. Um, and officially, those delays are explained by the negative opinion given to the proposal by uh, an entity that is called Regulatory Scrutiny Board, which is an independent body within the Commission that advises the College of commis Commissioners, and it provides quality control and support for Commission impact assessments and evaluations um, at early stages of their legislative process. What the Brussels-based NGOs are reporting is that the file is managed behind closed doors. Mm. There are very few communications with civil society and even mm. journalists who are used to have easy access to commissioner staff. For example, they feel a little bit lost by the management of the, of the case. It seems like mm. it's all very not transparent mm. and, um, and, and really no one has a clue when the proposal will be out and what the content of it will be which is I, I guess a bit ironic right because the whole like a major aspect of the law would be to increase transparency along the supply chain law or along the supply chains and then the fact that the that the very process of getting this legislation into place is not transparent um it's at least not a good sign and i i've read this report um called off the hook and um, which outlines um, a lot of key details of this um, legislation. And it outlines the reactions that corporations have had, because obviously they're the ones that would stand to lose um, in this, um, if this proposal was passed. And so what they've been doing is sicking their lawyers on all of the EU politicians and, you know, using excuses like, the corona crisis is, um, uh, we need to delay the proposal because of the corona crisis and some companies wanting, um, you know, incentives instead of punishments. And then some corporations who are, uh, corporate lawyers who are trying to limit the liability that the proposal would uh, would set up. So what what do you all say about this uh, reaction of the corporate lobbyists who are trying to fight, 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 fight against this proposal? Uh, well, indeed, yeah, corporate lobbyists are being really active at the moment. So they have presented different tactics, like some show outright hostility, while others more insidiously claim to be cooperative to then better work on the rules. Mm -hmm. So several excuses are presented, like fears of increased risk of litigation, frivolous claims, or legal uncertainty, or even negative and unwanted impacts like jeopardizing meaningful and suspectful company practices to better weaken the rules. Mm -hmm. And some multinational and lobby groups actually try to restrict or even ban strong liability provision with a safe harbor clause to be exempted from liability, or they do not want to cover the whole company's entire value chains. Mm -hmm. Lobbyists rather focus on positive incentive to avoid a punitive approach with serious consequences for companies involved in violation. But focusing on the means and not the result is another tactic to stop companies' obligation at the due diligence process regardless of whether that process succeeds in preventing harmful impacts. And similarly, voluntary industry-led schemes have been used to deflect the need for binding laws, even though these kinds of multi-stakeholder initiative aren't appropriate tools for accountability, access to justice, remedy, or good human rights and environmental protection. Mm -hmm. And there is also a phenomenon called corporate captures that we need to explain. Mm -hmm. Corporate capture occurs when a policy agenda or a new legislation is influenced in the extreme, often from the beginning and on an ongoing basis by corporate interests. So corporate lobbyists and business elites, they rely on different tactics to promote their, their 
agenda, including uh, providing corporate dominated advice or expertise throughout mm -hmm. the policy making process, or also the smooth movement of staff to and from public institutions and big business. Mm -hmm. um, they have a privileged access of business interest to top decision makers and officials uh, responsible for handling key dossiers. And as an example, for uh, as an example, mm -hmm. <laughs> corporate lobbyists pushed for Commissioner Breton um, in charge of internal markets to be appointed as a co-lead for the elaboration of the Commission's proposal on uh, the Sustainable Corporate Governance Directive, which includes the whole due diligence topic. Mm -hmm. And he himself, he is the former head of a multinational, a French one, and mm. has always <laughs> advocated for voluntary rules over mandatory norms right. and his office has been very open to meeting with companies mm -hmm. um, throughout the, the, the past months, whereas he almost never met with civil society organizations despite our uh, repetitive petitions to mm -hmm. meet with him. Right. So that's and just one example of that phenomenon of corporate capture. Yeah, and this is like one of the biggest critiques of the European Union, right? That this, this revolving door in Brussels Um, and my next question is then in the past, um, what, when I think of corporate responsibility, I think about CSR reporting, like this corporate social responsibility, um, which obviously has its flaws. And that's, I mean, I say obviously, because that's why we, uh, we wouldn't need this due diligence, uh, law if CSR reporting were actually, having sufficient results. So um, can you maybe talk a little bit about what has been used in the past to keep multinational companies from, you know, acting in a destructive manner? Sure. So um, so there are some institutional initiatives and guidelines already in place to try to hold corporations accountable for their harms to society and the environment. So, for example, there are international voluntary guidelines, the United Nations Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights, known as UNGPs, that were adopted in 2011 and kind of consist of the state duties to protect rights, the company's responsibility to respect rights and provision facilitating access to remedy for victims of corporate abuse. We also have the revised OECD guidelines for multinational enterprise in 2011, or the ELO reported declaration of principle concerning multinational enterprise and social policy that are mainly a list of recommendations to corporations on how to conduct human rights due diligence. Mm -hmm. But while the UNGPs and the OECD's guidelines are supported by the international community, they actually remain largely voluntary and do fail to provide justice for victims, prevent abuse, and hold multinational accountable. So within the European Union, there are some due diligence elements in certain legal framework, like the timber regulation, the conflict mineral regulation, or the non-financial reporting directive, which establish companies' disclosure obligation on human rights risk and measure. And we can see also that some European countries had adopted national laws in relation to due diligence. So in 2017, France adopted the first law introducing mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence obligations for French companies. Mm -hmm. And since then, other EU member states have followed, like the Dutch child labor due diligence law in 2019, the German supply chain law in 2021, mm -hmm. and there's also other legislative proposals being discussed in countries like Austria, Belgium, Netherlands, mm -hmm. Finland, and Luxembourg. And like uh, Florian just said, so many of those uh, initiatives and norms are voluntary measures mm -hmm. to be adopted by the companies themselves. Mm -hmm. And we find also this approach in the corporate social responsibility field that you mentioned, Elise, mm -hmm. and that has greatly developed over the last decades, uh, as well as the use of social audits and certifications to establish that products were being produced according to human rights and environmental standards. However, uh, the failures of those social editors and certifiers have um, resulted in countless human rights violation and loss of life, and they have been amply documented. There is abundant evidence of how ineffective these mechanisms are in identifying, on the one hand, and preventing human rights abuses, and how fundamentally flooded the private 
audit system is as a whole. And that's why it's essential for us to ensure that the upcoming legislation at the EU level explicitly excludes social audits and certification as adequate proof of mm. human rights due diligence mm. in a court of law or in any other relevant enforcement actions. Mm. Companies cannot keep on uh, being exempted and, and not being held accountable because they have uh, put into place a social audit or because that supplier had a certification. This cannot mm -hmm. go on as a, as a way of avoiding accountability. Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, Florian, that uh, you also have um, other institutions in place that are um, more recommendations for multinational companies to act a certain way um, and to have these audits and certifications. And um, but then you also mentioned that national uh, that nations can also have their own um, legislation, supply chain legislation. For example, you mentioned France's duty of vigilance law. Um, so you know if if things are not moving forward at the European level, um, you could also, as an activist, um, demand that your national government crack down on multinationals at home. Um, so maybe could you talk about the supply chain law in France, maybe its strength, strength and weaknesses and, um, and the opportunities for national law to make a difference? Um, so as you say, the French law on due diligence was adopted in 2017. And it was actually the result of a difficult struggle and four years of mobilization and political pressure. But this is the first in the world because it actually creates a new obligation to prevent and remedy human rights violation and environmental damage caused by multinational activities and by the activities of their subsidiaries, subcontractors or suppliers. So it concerns companies established in France that employ at least 5,000 employees in France or 10,000 worldwide, and it applies to the entire supply chain. So the law covers all sectors of activity and has a real broad field of application, as it covers all serious violations of human rights and fundamental freedom, the health and safety of individuals and the environment. So what the law established is that companies are legally obliged to publish a due diligence plan in their annual report and to implement it effectively to identify and prevent the risk of human rights and environmental abuse. So they also have to monitor and evaluate the measures. But the law also provides two judicial mechanisms to ensure its application. So, for example, if a company fails to establish, publish or implement a due diligence plan, any person with an interest in acting so it can be human rights or environmental association, trade unions, or even affected population, all of this person can give formal notice to comply with its obligation. And if the company still does not respect it three months after the formal notice, then you can bring a case before a friend judge, even for victim abroad. Mm -hmm. So then the company can be held civilly liable. Mm. But victim must then demonstrate to the judge that violation and damage have occurred and that they're a result of the failure to comply with due diligence. And then after that, the company may be required to pay damages to the victim. But the law also has some weaknesses. So, for example, the thresholds are high and some companies in high risk sectors do not fall under the law because of these numbers. And in the case of complaint against a multinational, actually, the burden of the proof is always on the complainant. Another main weakness of the French law also is that there's no official list of which companies have an obligation to comply with the due diligence process. So not even the government can know who is affected. Wait and a it's a role so that's not so it doesn't apply to every French company? Like across the no, board? No. So it only applies to companies that have over five thousand employees in France oh. or companies that have over ten thousand employees worldwide. So, for example, companies that don't fall into this threshold, even though they're in high-risk sectors, for example, won't be held accountable by this law. Mm. Hmm. And what she was mentioning is that we don't have an official list of which companies are within those uh, thresholds, those levels of employees, etc., because this is a criteria that has been um decided in the law um, and so big companies for example in the mining sector uh, in the energy sector that have officially less than 5,000 mm. employees in France and less than 10,000 worldwide 
they would not fall under the scope of the of the law, for example. Wow. Or we we have also debates because some companies they argue that they yeah the numbers are really difficult to 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 establish hmm. and to base um, yeah the need for a company to to uphold the law and to respect the law. It's it's really a big issue of that of that law. Yeah, and I mean. Energy companies and mining companies are some of the most environmentally and socially damaging sectors of our economies. So exactly, that's a yeah. that's really upsetting. And also, I can imagine it's difficult trying to figure out how many people are involved when there's so many different layers in the, up the supply chain. Okay, so. In these episodes of Inequality Talks, we, of course, do not want to only talk about what's wrong with the world, but also how it could be better. Um, so I would just like to ask um, two questions. You can answer one or the other or both. Um, so what are some positive developments that could give us hope for the future? Or what would supply chain law look like in your ideal world? Um, so I think we're going to mention a few positive developments of uh, the last few years. Um, so, for example, in France, since we have the law, um, there have been close to 10 actions that have been brought to justice to seek remedy for victims of French companies' abuses. Uh, so now we have to wait and see what the results of the lawsuits will be, because uh, so far they are still on, on the early stages of the process. But we recently had a win that will that really make make us um, being hopeful. So the win was about the constitutional court, so the highest uh, jurisdiction in France, um, deciding and ruling that all the cases based on the due diligence law would be examined by the judicial court. So this was a very important procedural um, point because in 2019, the very first case was brought to justice by uh, the NGOs Friends of the Earth, Survi, and four Ugandan NGOs. Uh, it was the first ever legal action based on the law against Total uh, regarding the activity of its subsidiaries and subcontractors in Uganda for the construction of a massive pipeline going from Uganda to T Tanzania. And the project has caused massive expropriation and intimidation to local communities, and it is still estimated that more than um, 100,000 persons are currently affected by the impact of the project, mm. with hunger, loss of means of subsistence, loss of education, health, etc. It's really a massive impact on the population. And because the, the French law did not specify which court should know about the cases, of course, the companies argued that the case should be um, judged by the commercial court. The commercial court is presided by uh, heads of enterprises that just volunteer to do a judge <laughs> activity. Mm. Um, and of course, the NGO and the civil society and the communities, we argue that the judicial um, court should know about the cases because they are uh, professional judges competent to examine human rights violations. Um, and all of this has taken two years of procedural uh, going back and forth between the different courts up to the higher one. And at least for now, we had a win on uh, the fact that the matters of human rights and environmental abuses have to be examined by the judges of the judicial courts. Mm. So it's, it's just a technical, very tiny mm -hmm. detail. Mm. But to show you the importance of this, because the companies mm. really just make the most out of any approximation or any doubt that we can have, mm -hmm. they will use it. They have, of course, armies of uh, lawyers in, and mm -hmm. a lot of means that as NGOs and local communities affected, we don't have. Um, so this was really a, a big win for us. And now we are waiting on, like I said, on the cases to go forward and um, and we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but we are hopeful for that. Also, because there is a process at the United Nations level that is going to move forward. Uh, it's a process that started in 2016 under the pressure of social movements and mm -hmm. especially uh, Latin American movements 
that really demanded um, corporate accountability. And so the Human Rights Council uh, of the United Nations issued a mandate for a working group to elaborate a legally binding instrument to regulate the activities of, tra of transnational corporations and other business enterprises. And in 2021, for the first time in October in Geneva, states' representatives started to negotiate the actual content of the treaty. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there are some states that are strong opponents to any international mandatory regulation of business activities, such as the United States, but also many um, authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but luckily, others and a lot of states also um, supported by the civil society are in favor of the process. And we are trying to push for it to, to move forward because it will be an incredible import opportunity to have uh, worldwide international standards, mandatory uh, regulation in that field. And like we mentioned also, the European Parliament adopted a very, at a very large majority a resolution calling on the EU to implement a mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. So there is also a great support and expectations from members of the Parliament and, and something we can use. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for those um, positive developments that can give us hope for the future. The only thing also I wanted to mention about positive development that there are also like stronger mobilization from civil society. So maybe you remember like the campaign on social networks about the Uyghur calling out textile industry brands, non-subcontract companies that enslave Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. I think it really highlighted the capacity social media can have in gathering civil society and mobilizing younger people. And similarly, there was a YouGov poll published in October 2021 in nine EU states. And it really found that 80% of European citizens want ambitious legislation to hold companies legally accountable for human rights and environmental abuse. So there's a support for this European directive. And I think within that, the European project Our Food of Future really takes on its full meaning as it aims at mobilizing young people on the failings of the global food chain supply and its impact on human rights and environmental rights. So it's really crucial to raise awareness and inform young people to mobilize them, to enable them to become responsible committed citizens aware of the food choice and to encourage them to advocate for the regulation of multinational, holding them accountable and developing due diligence for the respect of human rights and the environment. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is, as you mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, Florian, that um, it is something that people want. And um, I think it's a matter of, um, you know, public awareness, but also learning these technicalities that um, maybe people who are not fully immersed in this world are a bit unfamiliar with, like myself. But I learned so much from this episode with you, and I'm so glad that you took the time, uh, both of you, to come and talk to me today. So thank you so, so, so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> So, and um, that is all we have time for. Any details um, of our guests or the research uh, will be in the notes of this episode. And as a disclaimer, this was produced with the financial support of the European Union. Its contents are the sole responsibility of Our Food, Our Future Denmark and do not necessarily reflect the views of the European Union. We've got a lot going on in Mellemfakelet Samvirke. Um, we are a Danish NGO that works for a more just and sustainable world, collaborating with global partners worldwide as part of the ActionAid Alliance. Here in Aarhus, we have over 100 volunteers working together to run a not-for-profit cafe and campaign and educate in areas ranging from feminism and climate justice to anti-discrimination and economic inequality to queer issues and refugee rights. You can come down to Café Malmfark every day but Sunday, for amazing food, drinks, and events in a cozy cafe run by our lovely volunteers. You can also get involved with our events, activities, and campaigns, and even running the cafe as a volunteer yourself. So check out Instagram and Facebook to find out more about our cafe and our campaigns by looking up Café Melenfolk or Melenfolk at Samviega Ohus, or following the links in the episode notes. And check out Podbean, YouTube, and other podcast providers for more episodes, interviews, and cool stuff. 
Details are in the episode description. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And until next time, goodbye.